Reggie Cole was just a child when his family moved from Louisiana to an area of Los Angeles, California called South Central. When the Coles arrived in 1985, South Central, which had a population of half a million people, was seeing a huge uptick in gang violence and drug dealing. But by the time Reggie, the youngest of the five Cole children, had turned 10 years old, the family had managed to move from an apartment on 98th Street in one of the most dangerous areas of South Central to 71st Street, one of the few somewhat safe neighborhoods in the area. They lived in a small tan bungalow that had a neat front yard that was bordered by rose bushes and shaded by palm and eucalyptus trees. Reggie's mother was a deeply religious woman. She made sure all of her children attended the local missionary Baptist church every Sunday. She was also strict and told her two daughters and three sons that they had to be inside the house every night before the streetlights came on. Reggie's stepfather, who had raised the Cole kids as if they were his own, worked in an aluminum factory. He was from a small town in Louisiana, and in their new South Central neighborhood, he became known for his soul food. On Sundays, the Cole children always looked forward to a big meal of red beans, rice, black-eyed peas, and collards. But for one of the Cole children, the middle son named Kenny, home was not on 71st Street. For him, home was the old neighborhood where the family had lived on 98th Street, where Kenny was part of a violent gang called Nine Deuce Hoover Crips. And when Kenny was 15 and Reggie was 10, Kenny was killed in that old neighborhood in a drive-by shooting. His killer was never caught. Reggie was devastated. Always small and skinny, he had idolized his older brother, and Kenny had always protected Reggie from neighborhood bullies. For a while after the murder of his brother, Reggie continued to do well in school. He got good marks in junior high and joined his other brother as an usher in church on Sundays, and he kept up with school social events, playing basketball and attending his junior high prom. But by the time Reggie was two years into high school, all that had changed. Reggie, who had inherited his deceased brother's friends and gang affiliations from the old neighborhood, was gradually sinking deeper and deeper into gang life. Because of his goofy attitude, Reggie became known to his brother's friends as Gumby. Although he still lived at home with his mom, Reggie had moved out of her house and into a shed in her backyard. His family called him Reggie, but now he preferred his street name, Gumby. And he'd started dressing down, which meant wearing the oversized jogging suits and sports apparel and expensive sneakers that marked him as a gang member. Then, in his senior year, he dropped out of high school, and at the same time, his mom and stepfather separated. Once he was out of school, Reggie spent all of his time on the streets, or in his shed, where the walls were covered with gang graffiti and where he now grew two marijuana plants right outside the shed door. The gulf between Reggie's life and that of his siblings and mother also continued to grow. One of Reggie's older sisters was a bus driver and a choir director at the Missionary Baptist Church, his other sister had just enrolled in college, and Reggie's older brother was a hospital equipment operator. Reggie's brother-in-law had offered him work in his plumbing business, but Reggie wasn't interested. He always drifted back to his gang in the old neighborhood. So it was a huge disappointment to his mom, but not exactly unexpected, when Reggie, at the age of 16, had his first arrest after failing to stop for a police officer, and his second arrest later that same year for getting caught carrying a weapon. A year after that, in 1993, when Reggie was 17, the homicide rate in South Central had skyrocketed to the point where seven people were being killed there every week. And Reggie was at ground zero for all of that street violence, selling crack at motels along the Figueroa Corridor. Running 30 miles north and south through the city, Figueroa is one of the longest streets in Los Angeles, and today it has the highest arrest rate in the city for prostitution. Finally, in 1995, when Reggie was 19, his gang affiliations and his criminal behavior caught up with him. On August 1st of that year, Reggie was found guilty of fatally shooting a man who was standing outside of a known prostitution house on Figueroa Street. Reggie was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Immediately after the sentence was read, Reggie was placed in a holding cell at a county supermax facility in South Central until a prison transport bus could take him to his new home three and a half hours away in Imperial County. That new home was Calipatria State Prison, one of the most violent maximum security prisons in the California correctional system. 
A few days later, on the day Reggie was set to leave for Calipatria, he was thin and lanky, standing at almost six feet tall, but weighing just 140 pounds. He was also still wearing the orange jumpsuit he'd been wearing in county jail. Only now, as he climbed onto the prison transport bus in leg and ankle chains, the orange suit marked him as a brand new prisoner, or fresh fish, in the eyes of the level four offenders he would be spending the rest of his life with in Calipatria. As the bus headed east from the county jail in Los Angeles and crossed from the heart of the city into the desert, Reggie began to realize just how bad his situation really was. He was not just traveling to a new jail, he was leaving behind every one and everything he had ever known. About three hours later, while looking out the window of the bus, Reggie got his first glimpse of Calipatria Prison off in the distance. Its sprawling 325-acre complex of fences, towers, exercise pens, and two-story cell blocks sat in the middle of more than 1,200 acres of sandy, desolate no-man's land. As Reggie sat there staring, he suddenly realized he was soaked with sweat, despite the fact that the bus was running its air conditioning on full blast. But Reggie had no idea how comfortable that bus ride was relative to where he was going. In Calipatria Prison, when inmates were sent outside to the asphalt-covered exercise yard, there was almost no shade, and temperatures routinely reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the height of summer, temperatures could reach as high as 118 degrees Fahrenheit. And winters in Calipatria were actually just as bad as the summers, but for the opposite reason. During those months, temperatures would plunge well below freezing at night. As the bus rambled down the road, getting closer and closer to Calipatria, Reggie started to smell the cow manure from the cattle feedlots they were passing by. Reggie bent his head down toward his shackled hands to try to cover his nose, not realizing that there was absolutely no getting away from that smell. It would literally permeate every inch of his new home. Finally, the bus reached the prison. Before entering the prison grounds, the bus had to pass through a heavily guarded and fortified opening in a 13-foot-high electric fence topped with razor wire that outlined the perimeter of the maximum security area of Calipatria. The purpose of this fence, which had enough voltage in it to instantly kill anyone who touched it, was to cut down on prison escapes, and to allow correctional officers, who were outnumbered more than 50 to 1 by prisoners, to move from guarding the perimeter to patrolling the inside of the prison. However, this shift in manpower had done very little to stop the violence inside the prison. There was hardly anyone in California, including Reggie, who hadn't heard news reports about the horrible attack that had happened in Calipatria three months earlier. Five inmates armed with homemade knives stabbed and beat eight prison guards. None of the guards died, but the incident sent shockwaves through the state. After passing through the perimeter fence, Reggie's bus continued on towards the main prison. As they got closer, Reggie suddenly felt scared and wished the bus ride could go on for a little bit longer so he wouldn't have to get off. The bus finally reached a large garage just off of one of the main buildings. When the bus pulled into the garage, the inmates saw several guards standing around inside, clearly waiting for them. And behind these guards on the wall was a big security door that led into the prison. It actually went into an area called Receiving and Discharge, or R&D. R&D is where new inmates are cataloged, inventoried, and booked into the prison system and their specific prison facility. The bus driver pulled into the designated parking spot in the garage and then came to a complete stop. As the bus engine idled and Reggie and all of the other fresh fish sat anxiously on the bus, one of the guards outside, who was carrying a clipboard, stepped onto the bus and chatted with the driver for a moment. Then the guard turned and faced Reggie and the other men on board and started calling out their names one by one. As he did, each man got up and with their hands and feet in shackles, they shuffled to the back of the bus where another guard had opened the back door. There, they would walk down two steps to the garage floor. The guard at the back of the bus would then yell at them to make their way over to the door that led into R&D, and there, standing outside that door, were several more guards, all armed with pepper spray and batons, who would pat each man down and search them. After the men were searched, they were motioned to walk through the door into R&D. Although the chains and shackles he was wearing had already drilled into Reggie the fact that his life was now totally changed, 
he was still not prepared for the shock he felt when he finally stepped through the R&D door and was actually inside the prison. Inside, a guard watched every move Reggie made, and security glass and wire separated Reggie from the men and women who processed his paperwork. What little he had brought with him was about to be inventoried and put into a storage compartment. His only possessions going forward would be the items that prison officials would give him over the next several hours. After stepping into a big windowless room, he was told to take off his clothes, and then a guard with gloves on did the first of hundreds of strip searches that would become a routine part of Reggie's life. Then he was handed his prison issue clothing and told to get dressed. After he was, he was given his inmate ID card that he would keep with him at all times. Reggie was also given two blankets, two sheets, a washcloth, a pillowcase, soap, toothpaste, and a toothbrush. After leaving R&D, Reggie was walked to his cell. In Calipatria, the cell blocks were all two stories high, with each cell door facing out toward a common area that the guards patrolled. Unlike what most people imagine when they think of jail cells, these cells did not have bars with lots of openings to look through. The cell walls were concrete, with no windows, and the doors were heavy sheet metal with only two small vertical slits that were windows that they could look through out into the common area. Inside of Calipatria, every sound reverberated off of the concrete and metal, meaning it was always noisy and extremely difficult to sleep. As Reggie was led by the guard to his cell, the awful sounds echoing all around of people yelling and banging on things were so distracting and awful that his initial impulse was just to run away to somewhere that was quiet. But of course, as soon as he had that impulse, he remembered that he'll never be able to do that, ever. This was his reality. When Reggie finally entered his single-person cell and heard the door shut behind him, he felt himself relax just a little bit. He looked around his tiny room and saw a metal sink and a toilet as well as a bunk bed. And as he looked at the bunk bed, it took him a second to process that there was another person laying on it. Although Calipatria had only opened three years earlier in 1992, by the time Reggie arrived, it was already completely overcrowded, which is why single-person cells like this one now held two people. The man laying in the bottom bunk stared at Reggie. Reggie looked away. He knew better than to try to be friends with this man. Keeping his head down and making sure he did not touch the lower bunk where his cellmate was still watching him, Reggie awkwardly made up the top bunk with the sheet and blankets he'd been given in R&D. Then, once his bed was made, Reggie walked a few feet over to the metal toilet. He did his business. Then, without a word, he hauled himself up onto the top bunk, where he lay staring at the ceiling in silence. Within the first few weeks of Reggie's arrival, he was given his first lesson in prison survival. He was out in the exercise yard when an older inmate, who was sitting on top of one of the picnic tables, motioned Reggie over. With his elbows propped on his knees, the inmate stared at Reggie as if sizing him up. Then he told Reggie, you need to find people from your neighborhood, and then you need to join one of the gangs, and if possible, you join the same gang that you ran with on the outside. And don't trust anyone. No one here is your friend. Oh, and make yourself a knife. Reggie thanked him and decided he would take his advice. Inside the prison, Reggie began scanning the inmates for tattoos that signified they were in the crypts, like he had been when he was still a free man. Outside in the yard, Reggie continued to scan the inmates, but he kept to the perimeter where he couldn't be seen as disrespecting anyone or invading their space. Reggie also always carried a homemade knife, which was a toothbrush he had filed down against the concrete. But before Reggie was invited to join a gang, which would offer him protection, he was challenged. Reggie had been making his usual perimeter walk out in the yard when a bigger inmate and a few of his crew walked over and stood in front of Reggie, blocking his path. Then the main guy started muscling Reggie against the fence. Reggie already knew what happened to Fresh Fish, who did not stand up to the first sign of any kind of disrespect or aggression. In fact, he'd seen it over and over again right in his own cell. His cellmate, the same one who had been laying on the bottom bunk when Reggie first arrived, had made the mistake of thinking a few visitors to their cell, men neither of them knew, were there as friends. His cellmate had welcomed them inside and shook hands with them, while Reggie had remained on the top bunk and pretended to be asleep. The men who had come inside immediately grabbed Reggie's cellmate, threw him on the ground, and raped him. When 
they were done, they left without touching Reggie. Because Reggie's cellmate had not fought back during this first assault, these men would come back many more times, and each time Reggie would be forced to listen to it while he lay still and silent in his top bunk. And like most of the inmate-on-inmate -inmate attacks at this prison, the rapes went unreported. Even if a guard took a charge like that seriously, the consequences of snitching on another inmate were much worse than any punishment a correctional guard could deal out. So, out in the yard, as Reggie found himself being muscled against the fence by this big guy, the thought of his cellmate being raped over and over again ran through Reggie's mind. He knew he had to stand up for himself. So Reggie reached into his waistband, he grabbed his homemade knife, and he stabbed the bigger inmate in the side. His aim was not to deliver a wound that would kill, or be so serious that the guards would have to investigate, but to use his weapon for defense and intimidation. From that day forward, while Reggie would never be known as a brawler, he did start to build a reputation as someone who was quick to use his blade, and therefore someone who was not to be messed with. Shortly after this stabbing, Reggie was welcomed into a gang called the 49 Deuce Crips. All the Crips at Calipatria were run by a single man, one of the most violent inmates there, a 200-pound bodybuilder named Eddie Clark, who went by the nickname El Diablo, or the Devil. For El Diablo, Calipatria was not just his home, it was his business. Calipatria was known as a money prison, where drugs were just as pervasive as unchecked violence, Reggie had seen dozens of inmates smuggle crack and heroin around the prison. They would put the drugs inside balloons before inserting them into their bodies, a practice that was extremely risky because the balloon could break or disintegrate once it was inside of them. And all this was part of the drug empire that was ruled by El Diablo. Even the guards recognized his power as Calipatria's shot caller, allowing him to wear a bright orange do-rag wrapped around his head out in the prison yard. Under the general protection of his new gang and their leader, El Diablo, Reggie's life got noticeably better. Not only was he now much more safe at the prison, but being a part of this gang also allowed Reggie to feel somewhat human again, whether it was playing basketball or leaning up against the picnic tables and chatting with fellow gang members, Reggie finally had people around him that he felt like he could trust. But like everyone else in the Deuce Crips, Reggie did his best not to interact with or attract any attention from El Diablo. Because even though El Diablo was their boss and main protector, they were all afraid of him. El Diablo was only 34 years old, but he had spent 20 of those years behind bars. When he was a juvenile, he beat another teenager to death. When he was an adult, he sexually assaulted an elderly woman and shot her son in the course of robbing their house. In prison, El Diablo was known to turn on people, even his own people, suddenly, viciously, and without warning. The devil was also connected to prison staff. Two years after he'd entered prison, he'd fallen in love with one of the corrections officers who oversaw one of the common areas where the devil spent time. He wrote her an eight-page long love letter where he told her that, quote, she had 75% of his heart. This was apparently enough for Lisa Finch, who eventually quit her job as a prison guard, married El Diablo, and on her visits to him in Calipatria, she smuggled in PCP-laced cigarettes that he could sell to other inmates. Over the next four years, Reggie carved out a relatively safe life for himself in Calipatria. He had managed to fit in with his new gang without upsetting El Diablo. He also managed to avoid making any real enemies outside of his gang. Over the course of those four years, Reggie spent much of his time exercising, which added some muscle to his thin frame. He also got several tattoos, including a Ghetto Star prison tattoo on his shoulders, as well as two Crips tattoos on his chest and stomach. But despite settling into a routine and starting to feel relatively comfortable, Reggie knew he and everyone else at that prison had a big problem. By 2000, so five years into Reggie's prison sentence, El Diablo had gone from just being a very intimidating inmate to being a monster. He would attack virtually anyone for virtually anything. Sometimes all it took was looking at him wrong to get stabbed or beaten or raped. This of course made life inside of the prison even more precarious than it already was, as no one knew who El Diablo's next target was going to be. By the fall of 2000, 
The devil, who was now manufacturing alcohol from the fruit juice he stole from the prison kitchens, had developed such a substance abuse problem that some of his own fellow gang members had tried, unsuccessfully, to stage an intervention. As one inmate recalled, when he was drunk, he was an animal. If he raped you, nobody was going to say anything. But it would turn out that out of all the violent and dangerous offenders in Calipatria who might have stood up to El Diablo and challenged his authority, it would be Reggie, one of the least ruthless inmates who would finally do it. In late October of that year, an inmate using a slingshot fired a homemade dart at one of the corrections officers out in the prison yard. The dart missed and stuck into a gatepost instead. Immediately, the guards ordered all the inmates to lay on the ground so they could do a weapons check to see who had thrown the dart. The guards didn't discover who had thrown it. However, during their search, they did find a homemade knife inside of a cotton glove laying out in the grass. The guards didn't know this, but the knife belonged to El Diablo's cellmate, who was one of El Diablo's most trusted lieutenants. And so as the guards picked up the knife and began asking whose it was, every inmate in the yard knew El Diablo was going to do something to protect his cellmate from getting caught. El Diablo's eyes traveled across the yard and came to a stop on Reggie Cole, who just happened to be out on work assignment painting one of the prison walls that faced into the yard. Reggie was already serving a life sentence without parole, so adding a weapons charge wouldn't actually change his sentence. Paintbrush in hand, Reggie held his breath, but even with his eyes down, he could feel El Diablo's sudden attention and the silence that filled the yard. Reggie looked up and saw the devil staring right at him. Then, El Diablo made a single motion with his hand, pointing to the knife in the corrections officer's hand. He might as well have shouted his order. You, Reggie, you take the blame for this. For just a moment, Reggie's mind went blank. Then, he saw in his mind what would happen if he agreed to do this for the devil. He might be sent to solitary confinement. He might have his family visitation rights revoked. And he would be publicly submitting to another inmate, which would make him look weak. And if he agreed to submit this one time, then he'd likely spend the rest of his life at Calipatria under the thumb of other inmates. So with El Diablo staring at him expectantly, Reggie paused and then said the words that changed the course of his and El Diablo's life. No, not my knife, Reggie said. The silence that followed the statement was deafening. Even the corrections officers looked stunned. Reggie did not look at El Diablo but both men knew at that moment Reggie was now a marked man. El Diablo would make sure that Reggie paid the highest price possible for refusing this direct order. Over the next four weeks, Reggie expected to be attacked by El Diablo or one of his henchmen at any moment. As the nights grew colder, Reggie would lie in his bunk, sleepless, thinking about his options. The way he saw it, there were only four of them. He could submit to El Diablo and do whatever he wanted to pay for his insubordination. He could snitch on El Diablo to the guards. He could kill El Diablo, or he could be killed by El Diablo. Reggie obsessed over these four choices. He'd pace around the perimeter of the exercise yard, keeping a very wide berth around El Diablo, weighing out the pros and cons of each action. Finally, Reggie made up his mind. He didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but he knew he'd be ready when the time was right. It all happened on the morning of November 28, 2000, roughly one month after Reggie had refused to take the blame for the knife. That day, Reggie was walking around the perimeter of the exercise yard when he noticed the devil walking toward him. The devil wasn't even trying to sneak up on Reggie. It seemed like he wanted Reggie to know that he was about to get attacked. Reggie stopped and just watched the devil as he got closer, not really sure what he should do. When the devil was finally right in front of him, he didn't say anything. He just reached out and grabbed Reggie's shoulder with his left hand, and then with his right, he drove a knife into Reggie's side. Not far enough to be a lethal blow, but enough to send a very painful message that Reggie's days were numbered. As he pulled the knife out of Reggie, El Diablo leaned forward and whispered into Reggie's ear, You are my bitch and then he chucked the knife onto the grass and casually walked away. Reggie pressed his hand over his wound, he gritted his teeth, and he walked in the opposite direction of El Diablo over towards the fence. There was nothing anyone could do for him. The guards made no sign of having even noticed the attack, and even if they had, Reggie, like other victims of El Diablo's violence, would have lied. 
About 15 minutes later, a bell sounded, signaling the exercise period was over. The guards and inmates knew the drill. The inmates would line up and be searched for weapons or contraband before they were allowed to re-enter the cell blocks. El Diablo was ahead of Reggie in the line. Reggie, hiding his stab wound under the waistband of his pants, stood there quietly, clutching a six-inch long knife that he had dug out of its hiding place near the fence just minutes after he had been attacked by El Diablo. A corrections officer ordered El Diablo to turn around while he was still in line and to stretch out his arms so he could be searched. The devil did this, and as he was turned around, he stared menacingly at Reggie. On the devil's right forearm, there was a tattoo of a hand gripping a sword. On his right ribcage was a self-portrait of El Diablo slitting a man's throat. Looking up and finally meeting El Diablo's eyes, Reggie suddenly leapt over the crouched prison guard who was between them searching El Diablo, and Reggie drove the point of his homemade knife directly into the front of El Diablo's throat. El Diablo, still staring at Reggie, but now with a look of terror on his face, staggered backwards and off to the side. The blade had gone straight through his voice box, and blood was now pouring out of that one-inch hole in the center of his neck. Reggie immediately threw himself to the ground, putting his hands behind his back. As he laid there looking up at the stunned El Diablo, Reggie knew the wound he had just inflicted was fatal. As everyone else in the yard also got down on the ground and guards started firing off their cans of pepper spray, Reggie told one of the nearby guards, I know what I did, I know what I did. By the time the doctor arrived 30 minutes later, El Diablo was dead. By late that afternoon, Reggie had been placed into solitary confinement. Other inmates may have hated and feared El Diablo, but by killing Calipatria's shot caller, El Diablo's lieutenants would be gunning for Reggie. Not only that, Reggie now faced another murder charge. If he was convicted, the only punishment left was the death penalty. And no one contested the fact that Reggie had committed this murder. There had been dozens of eyewitnesses, including prison guards, who had seen Reggie fatally stab El Diablo. Also, there was security camera footage, and there was Reggie's own confession, one that he never tried to recant. Instead, Reggie actually went on record, saying that he felt bad for killing El Diablo because El Diablo was a human being who had a family that was going to hurt when they heard the news. But Reggie also insisted that he murdered El Diablo in self-defense. If a judge accepted this, the first-degree murder charge would be dropped to manslaughter and Reggie would escape the death penalty, but he would still face 10 years in solitary confinement. Both outcomes seemed so grim that even to Reggie, hiring a lawyer and preparing a defense seemed both hopeless and pointless. When Reggie was handed a list of county-approved attorneys, he looked at it, but none of the names meant anything to him. However, it would turn out that Reggie's random choice of a lawyer named Christopher Plord would be the second most important decision of his life, right after his decision to kill El Diablo. Because over the course of the next three years, his lawyer, Christopher Plord, dressed in his crumpled suits and peering out from behind his wire-rimmed glasses, would make a huge discovery about Reggie that would change everything. And the way Christopher made that discovery was by digging into the murder case that had landed Reggie in Calipatria in the first place. Six years before the murder of El Diablo, late on the night of Monday, March 28, 1994, two LAPD homicide detectives arrived at the scene of a murder. It was right outside of a known house of prostitution on Figueroa Street, the street in South Central that Reggie used to spend a lot of his time on, the victim was a 29-year-old man named Felipe Gonzalez Angeles. He was found lying on the ground with a gunshot wound in his back. The police located the prostitution house manager, a pimp named John Jones, who also became their star eyewitness. According to John, who saw the attack from the second floor window of the house, he said Felipe showed up to the house that night in a car with two other men. Felipe had gotten out, he had walked up to the door and knocked loudly. When one of John's staff members had opened the door, Felipe had asked to see a specific prostitute, but he was told she was busy. So Felipe turned around and started walking back toward the car where his other two friends were. But before he could get to the car, three teenagers, two of which had guns, appeared out of the darkness and demanded Felipe give them his money. They also yelled at Felipe's two friends who were in the car to do the same thing. But Felipe and his friends didn't speak English and just stood there seeming confused. 
at which point the teenagers just started shooting at Felipe and his friends in the car. Felipe got hit in the back as he tried to flee, and his friends, they sped off in the car. The teenagers turned and ran down an alley, but before they disappeared, John said he noticed one of them was limping. John figured in the chaos, this teen had gotten accidentally shot in the leg by his own friend or even by himself, potentially. A few weeks after the murder, a tip from police working a different crime altogether would lead those two LAPD detectives who arrived at Felipe's murder scene to Reggie Cole and his friend and fellow Crip, Obi Anthony, who were both in jail at the time on charges of suspected carjacking. One of the two detectives brought Reggie into an interrogation room, and during the questioning, the detective examined Reggie's legs, and very quickly, he found a gunshot wound. Based on the presence of this gunshot wound on Reggie's leg, and the eyewitness testimony of the pimp, John Jones, Reggie and Obi were both found guilty of murdering Felipe Angeles, and they both were sentenced to life in prison without parole. But looking at that case six years later, with his client, Reggie, in solitary confinement facing yet another murder charge, all Christopher Plord saw were some very big cracks in the LAPD investigation. Over the next three years, Christopher unearthed forensic evidence showing that the bullet that killed Felipe had not been fired from street level, but rather from above, maybe even from the roof or from John Jones's own apartment window. There were no fingerprints at the crime scene that matched Reggie's or Obie's, and no witness could ever identify Reggie as the shooter. John Jones himself had retracted his own testimony, saying that he had told the cops what they wanted to hear in exchange for a lighter sentence when it came to his own crime of running a prostitution house. But by far the most surprising and damning discovery Christopher made about Reggie's case had to do with the wound on Reggie's leg. It was indeed a gunshot wound, however, it was not anywhere near recent. It was the result of an accident that had happened to Reggie when he was 13 years old, five years prior to the murder of Felipe Angeles. And when the LAPD detectives saw this wound in the interrogation room, they would have known it could not possibly have happened recently. It was just a big scar and Reggie clearly wasn't affected by it. He was not limping at all. In addition to the extremely flimsy case against Reggie for that murder charge, another factor that enhanced the likelihood that Reggie was innocent was Reggie's own behavior after getting convicted. In Calipatria, where violence was power and inmates proudly talked about being killers, Reggie was one of the only inmates who insisted he was not a killer that he was innocent of his crime. And whenever he wasn't in his cell or working or exercising in the yard, he was spending hours in the prison law library researching wrongful convictions. In February 2008, after Reggie had spent 14 years in prison, eight of those years in solitary confinement, his lawyer, Christopher Plord, took Reggie's original murder case back to court. And this time, the judge decided that Reggie was innocent, that he had been wrongfully convicted. Following that decision, the state prosecutor agreed to drop the capital murder charge against Reggie in the death of El Diablo. Instead, he reduced the charge to 10 years in solitary confinement for manslaughter, agreeing that in killing El Diablo, Reggie had acted in self-defense. By the time that ruling came down, Reggie had already spent eight years in solitary, which were counted towards his 10-year solitary sentence. So, two long years later, on May 15, 2009, Reggie Cole finished his solitary confinement sentence and walked out of Calipatria State Prison. He was a free man once again. But Reggie was hardly a happy man. Wrongfully imprisoned for a murder he did not commit, Reggie was only cleared and made free again because of a murder he did commit, and this haunts him. After Reggie's friend, Obi Anthony, was also determined to have been wrongfully convicted, he too was released. In October 2012, the city of Los Angeles paid $8.3 million to Obi Anthony, and in January 2017, it paid $5.2 million to Reggie Cole. 
When Mary Kelly was still just a little girl, her two older sisters nicknamed her Mary Sunshine. This is because every morning, as soon as the girls would wake up, Mary would leap out of bed and run around her house, pushing aside all the curtains so every room in the burly Idaho home filled with sunshine. The nickname stuck because it not only captured her cute morning routine, but it also captured her sense of optimism, energy, and radiance that people associated with her for her entire life. When Mary was born on October 11th, 1921, Burley was just a small rural town in southern Idaho with a population of just over 5,000 people. Most of its residents, the Kelly family included, were farmers, and the main crops grown in the town were grains, sugar beets, potatoes, and alfalfa. Like her older brother and two older sisters, Mary loved living on her family's farm. The kids held barnyard rodeos, they had potato fights every fall after the harvest was done, and during the hot summers, they cooled off in the irrigation canal near their house. Mary's parents were devout Mormons, and this religion would always be central to Mary's life. Members of the Mormon Church, called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or LDS for short, believe their church is actually the original Christian church started by Jesus Christ and brought back or restored in 1830 by LDS church founder Joseph Smith Jr. The teachings of the church, which center around the teachings of Jesus Christ, were all written down by Joseph Smith Jr. in a book titled The Book of Mormon. Despite Mormons being known for living very modest and reserved lives, for example, they don't drink alcohol, they avoid caffeine and tobacco, Still, Mary's childhood home was a very fun, raucous place filled with music and stories. Mary was the daughter of a big, charismatic Irish father and a tiny English mother who sang duets together at church. Mary inherited her mother's quick wit, her sparkling blue-green eyes, and her curly hair, but she had her father's sense of humor. Her father also taught her at an early age how to dance and how to yodel. When Mary was 13 years old, a new family named the Campbells arrived in the neighboring town of Unity and joined the same LDS church in Burley that the Kellys attended. Among the Campbells' 13 children was a handsome 16-year-old son named Curtis. He was dark-haired and serious with a flair for math, electronics, and engineering. By the time Mary was 16 and Curtis was 19, they had fallen in love. And the next year, in 1938, the two of them got married. Over the next 14 years, Curtis and Mary moved more than six times. They bounced from Utah to Idaho and then back to Utah. Then they made their way to Los Angeles, California, and Nevada. And wherever they lived, Mary was that mom who was full of energy, fun, and who loved a practical joke. At each new town, every kid in the neighborhood quickly learned that if you gave Mary a garden hose, you were sure to get soaked. And if she was inside washing dishes, you still weren't safe because she'd just open the kitchen window and soak you with the sink hose attachment. And no matter where they found themselves, Mary always made sure her family attended an LDS church and that the family was always involved in the church's education and activities. But for all her good nature and sense of fun, Mary was not a pushover. Once, when her car stalled out right in front of a green light, the vehicle behind her started honking their horn. Unable to get her car going, Mary casually hopped out of her car and walked back to the car behind her, and she knocked on the driver's window, and when the incredulous man rolled down his window to see what she wanted, she said to him in a very sweet voice, Mister, if you'll go up there and start my car for me, I'll sit back here and honk your horn for you. The driver went from angry to smiling and laughing, and then got out of his car and he walked up to Mary's car and proceeded to fix her engine for her. During those first 14 years of marriage, Curtis would serve in World War II as an aviation technician for the Navy. Mary would give birth to four sons and two daughters. However, two of the boys died shortly after they were born. Despite the heartbreak of losing those two children, the economic and political upheaval of a war that redefined the United States as the world's superpower, and the disruption of constantly moving and Curtis constantly changing jobs, Mary and Curtis still had a very strong and happy marriage. When Curtis walked through the door after work, his children knew their parents would always take a few minutes alone with each other to hold hands and talk about their day. In 1952, just ahead of their 15th wedding anniversary, the Campbell's good life got even better when Curtis landed a top-paying job as an engineer with Boeing Aircraft Company in Seattle, Washington. The work, developing the technology that would later be used to design drones for the U.S. military, was more exciting and challenging than anything else Curtis had ever done. 
The Campbells bought their first house, a three-bedroom bungalow just outside of Seattle. It had three bedrooms and a pastel-colored double porcelain sink in the narrow kitchen right under a window that overlooked the backyard. And so Mary loved to fire her sink hose out of that window to soak her kids and her kids' unsuspecting friends. When the kids had had enough of Mary's big practical joke, there were also empty lots on either side of this house where the kids had plenty of room to play and ride their bikes. Both Mary and Curtis were active in the local LDS church in their town of White Center, and within a year of their arrival there, Curtis became an ordained Mormon bishop and the leader of the ward where the Campbells attended church. Three years later, in 1956, Mary and Curtis welcomed their fifth child, a little boy who was immediately nicknamed Kelly after his mother's maiden name. Mary felt truly blessed. She was busy working in the church she loved, and she was busy raising her five beautiful children. But two years later, the Campbell's 20-year-long marriage fell apart. As bishop, Curtis had lots of one-on-one -on -one interactions with members of his ward. Often they involved counseling people about their marriages and relationships, as well as giving spiritual guidance. And in late 1957, Curtis began an adulterous affair with a young and strikingly beautiful young woman named Janice, who had come to him for advice about her marriage. Even after church elders stripped Curtis of his bishopship, Mary continued to defend him against accusations and rumors of infidelity. But in 1958, when Boeing reassigned Curtis to McGuire Air Force Base in Trenton, New Jersey, Mary had no choice but to face the terrible truth. Curtis told his wife he did not want her to go with him to New Jersey. Instead, it would be his lover, Janice, who eventually followed Curtis to the East Coast. Mary and her kids were devastated. The perfect life they thought they had was now ruined. Mary packed up her family and moved back to Utah, where her family was, to regroup. In letters to her sister, it was clear that Mary had made up her mind that she'd rather, quote, paddle her boat alone than accept anything less than a committed and faithful marriage. But that didn't mean Mary was opposed to the idea of reconciliation with Curtis. And it didn't take Curtis very long to see the damage he had done to himself and his family. Shortly after she moved to New Jersey with him, Janice left Curtis and went back to her parents' home in Utah, and so Curtis, now all alone, fell into a deep depression. Despite feeling betrayed and hurt by him, Mary was very worried about Curtis. So after nearly a year of being separated, when Curtis began to reach out to Mary and tell her how much he missed their life together, Mary was open to moving with the kids to New Jersey to be with him again. And in the spring of 1959, the Campbell family was reunited. And one year later, when Boeing sent Curtis from New Jersey back to Seattle, Mary would bring with them a sixth child, a baby boy, and Curtis would buy Mary her dream home, a big two-story farmhouse 20 miles south of Seattle. The white wood-sided house had a covered wraparound porch, a big kitchen, and a side entrance. The long gravel driveway was lined with trees and lilac bushes, which Mary loved. Most of the nearby properties were lettuce farms, and in the spring, the dark, damp fields would be covered in green. The local schools were good, and there was plenty of room for the children to play. And right after they had unpacked in their new home, Mary got deeply involved in LDS church activities. Over the next two years, she became the head of her local ward's relief committee. She was also a member of the church building fund committee, and she was active in primary, the LDS program that offered religious instruction to kids aged 3 to 12. But Mary had changed. The separation and Curtis's infidelity had taken some of the light out of her nature. It had also made her very sympathetic to the plight of divorced or single women. So in 1960, a year after they were back in Seattle in a little town called Kent, when the ward bishop asked Mary Ann Curtis to help counsel and support a young single mother who had just joined their ward and didn't know anyone, Mary was very quick to say yes. 26-year-old Thelma Ann Swenson was grateful for Mary and Curtis's help. Ten years earlier, she had moved to Utah from her hometown in England and married a Mormon from Salt Lake City. When the marriage broke down, she moved to Kent in Washington with her three young children, but she was just barely scraping by financially. Mary immediately hired Thelma to take care of her four-year-old son and new baby. Mary would often drop them off at Thelma's trailer home after Mary dropped her three older children off at school. This arrangement allowed Thelma to get a much-needed paycheck 
and it gave Mary more time to spend on church activities when her older kids were at school. As Thelma and Mary became friends, Thelma opened up to Mary and Curtis about problems she was having with her estranged husband. And when Thelma showed up one evening at their house with a bruise on her face, she told them that the injury was the result of her estranged husband hitting her. The Campbells were horrified and urged Thelma to contact them anytime she ever needed anything or anytime she ever felt like she was in danger. From that point on, Mary always made sure to invite Thelma and her kids to every holiday dinner just so that they wouldn't be alone a couple times a year. On the morning of Wednesday, March 8th, 1961, so roughly one year after Mary and her family had moved back to Seattle to the town of Kent, Mary was up early as usual, cooking breakfast for her kids and making bologna sandwiches for their bagged lunches. It was a cool 51 degrees Fahrenheit outside and very cloudy. When Mary looked out the window, she was just happy to see that at least it wasn't raining. By 8.30 a.m., Mary had all the kids packed into the family's Plymouth station wagon. The first real baby car seats wouldn't be invented until the next year, so Mary just made sure the kids used their seatbelts and she settled the baby, Russell, in the front passenger seat. Just before 9 a.m., she dropped her three older children, Scott and Janelle and Patty, off at school. She told her older daughter, 11-year-old Janelle, that Thelma would be picking up the girls after school and taking them to primary, their after-school church instruction program, but that she, their mom, would come get Janelle and Patty after primary and bring them home for dinner. Scott was 13 years old, which meant he didn't go to primary anymore as the age cutoff was 12, and at the age of 13, his parents had allowed him to begin walking home after school on his own. After smiling and telling her son she would see him after school, Mary looked behind her and checked that her four-year-old Kelly was still belted in the back seat, and then she turned to the front seat to make sure her seven-month-old baby, Russell, was still secured in that seat. Then Mary looked one more time at her older kids as they walked into the school building, and then she pulled away from the curb out of the parking lot and headed for her church, where she had two meetings that day. Shortly after walking into the LDS church, Mary turned and saw Thelma walk through the front door as well with her own young kids. Thelma shook off the hood of her coat and ran her fingers through her short, dark curls that were damp with Seattle's constant mist. She'd once told Mary that she thought she'd left all the rain and clouds behind her when she moved away from England, a place notorious for its wet weather. When Thelma looked around and saw Mary, she smiled and walked over. The two women chatted for a few minutes, Thelma confirming that she was all set to take Mary's four-year-old son Kelly home with her that afternoon for a play date. By the time Mary's second church meeting ended at noon, Mary was very thankful for Thelma's help. By that point, Mary's baby, Russell, had started to get restless and fussy, and so Mary was eager to get back to her home and put him down for a nap, and then maybe she'd have a little time to herself. It was about 12.30 in the afternoon when Mary drove up the long gravel drive to her house, parked the car in the detached garage, and let herself into her house through the side door, which led directly into the kitchen. Talking quietly to baby Russell, she walked without stopping through the kitchen and down the hallway past the door to the combination powder room and bathroom and into the dining room. Once there, she put down her purse on the dining room table and settled Russell into a small crib they had in the dining room. She gave him a kiss, then covered him with a thick cotton blanket. Still dressed in her coat, Mary decided to stop at the powder room to freshen up before going back to the kitchen. And so she turned around and began walking back down the hallway that she had just come in on, and then about halfway down, she turned left to go into the powder room bathroom. But as soon as she turned, she stopped right in the doorway, and then she screamed. Because a man she had never seen before in her life was standing right in front of her in the powder room bathroom. Paralyzed with shock, Mary just stood there as the man suddenly lunged out with his left hand and grabbed her and knocked her to the ground. Mary fell hard onto the hallway floor, but before she could even move, the man was on top of her with one of his knees pressing into her stomach and the other knee across her neck and jaw. Her scream was now muffled, and she saw the man raise his right arm above her head. She felt another wave of panic rush through her as she realized in his right hand was a length of metal pipe. But instead of striking her with the pipe, the man, while holding that pipe high over his head, told Mary to stop screaming. Instantly, Mary did as she was told. And then, lying there perfectly still under the crushing weight of her attacker, Mary felt a sudden calm wash over her. She nodded her head reassuringly, and the man slowly rose to his feet. 
Then the man reached down with his left hand to help Mary stand up. As she got to her feet, Mary noticed immediately that this man also had a gun in his front pocket. Then, as soon as Mary was on her feet, she did what she had done her whole life. She called on her faith and looked at the man in front of her, not as a monster, but as a human being. She took a moment to compose herself, pulling the skirt of her dress down and pushing back the hair that had come out of its clips. She straightened her glasses, she took a deep breath, and then she looked up at the man who was now just standing there awkwardly with his arms and his metal pipe down by his sides. She had never seen this person before. He was young, in his early 20s, with shaggy hair that fell across his pale, soft face. And he was huge. Not only tall, but very big and heavy. Mary let out a deep breath and then said, What do you want? The man seemed eerily calm. He told her that he was there because he needed money. The only cash Mary had was in her wallet, which was in the dining room. She told the man as much as she headed past him down the hall in that direction. The man followed behind her and then stood without saying anything while she opened her purse, took out her wallet, and then laid the three $1 bills that were inside along with some change on the dining room table. She also pulled out her credit cards and driver's license, laying them on the table as well. And then she also just said to the man, you know, anything of value in this house, it's yours. Even though this man had said he wanted money, the only item that he was interested in was her driver's license. He reached out and grabbed it, looking carefully at the typewritten name, then turning to her with his first question. Are you Mary Campbell? Mary nodded. Yes, I am. And then, as this was happening, the thing Mary was most worried about happened. In the crib, just a few feet away from them, Russell started crying. Mary silently prayed that the man would not hurt her child. And he didn't. As he stood there, still staring at her license, he casually told her to go take care of her baby. Feeling an enormous sense of relief, Mary turned away from the man and stepped quickly to the crib. She reached down and picked the baby up and rocked him for a second, all the while glancing across the room at the man, who had just put her license back on the table and was now emptying out the other contents of her purse onto the table. Mary changed Russell's diaper, and then she laid him carefully back down in his crib, then, Mary told the stranger very gently that her baby was going to keep crying if she didn't feed him, and so she really needed to go into the kitchen and make Russell a bottle. While that might have been true, in reality, all Mary was thinking about in that moment was just getting this intruder away from her baby. So she asked the man if he would like to join her in the kitchen as she makes the bottle, and maybe she could fix him something to eat as well. The man agreed, and the two walked down the hallway to the kitchen. Mary first, the man after her. While Mary prepared the bottle of milk, the man stood quietly in the middle of the kitchen without saying a word. After the bottle was ready, Mary walked past the man who stayed put, and she went back down the hallway all the way to the dining room where she fed Russell as quickly as she could. All the while, the man just stayed in the kitchen, standing there watching Mary down this hallway. After giving her baby a kiss on the forehead, Mary tucked him back into his crib and returned to the kitchen where the stranger was. Mary was too nervous to sit down, so she went to the refrigerator and took out the hamburger meat that she was planning to serve that night for her family's dinner. She unwrapped it and asked the stranger if she could make a hamburger for him. When he said no in a very polite tone, Mary couldn't help but feel sort of relieved. After that initial attack, the man had not threatened her in any way, and now he was just standing there quietly in her kitchen and being very polite about it. Mary took a few more quick glances at him and noticed that despite him being this really big person, he looked more like a child than a man. In fact, he couldn't be much older than her oldest child, Dell, a 19-year-old young man who had left home just two years earlier to join the Navy. As soon as she thought of her son, Dell, Mary felt even better. And slowly, her fear started to give way to her usual curiosity about people and her conviction that even the most flawed human beings could be helped and ultimately redeemed. So after her visitor very kindly refused the offer of a hamburger, Mary poured them both glasses of cold milk and set out a plate of the cookies she had made the night before. She sat down in one of the chairs that was nearest the sink at the kitchen table, and then she nodded to the chair opposite her on the other side of the table, and she asked the man if he would like to please sit down with her. The man seemed to like this idea, so he walked over and sat down. He also carefully laid the metal pipe he was carrying on the empty chair next to him. Once they were both seated at the kitchen table, Mary reached for a cookie and took a bite, and then pushed the plate in his direction. As he took a cookie off the plate, Mary asked him, 
why had he tried to rob her? The man explained that for the last six months, he had not been able to find any work, and he and his wife desperately needed money so they could buy food and take care of their two-year-old son. Mary listened, already turning ideas over in her head about how she might be able to help this young family like she and her husband had been helping Thelma. When there was an opening in the discussion, Mary gently encouraged the stranger not to rob her, that that was the easy way out and something he would likely regret. She then told him he should consider opening himself up to prayer and also to asking for help and guidance. They chatted for a few more minutes over the milk and cookies, then suddenly, the man asked Mary if she would like to go upstairs with him and see what he had done to her house. She couldn't tell if he was proud of what he did or if he felt bad and just wanted to show her. Clearly, there was something off about this man, but he didn't seem like he wanted to hurt her and she didn't want to make him angry again, so she said, okay, and together they headed up the stairs. Right away, she could see that the bedrooms and the hall closet and study had been ransacked. Articles of clothing had been pulled out of drawers and tossed on top of the floor. The man apologized for the mess, saying he had tried to make it look like a burglary had happened. When Mary knelt down in front of the bureau in the master bedroom to start refolding the clothes back into the drawers, the man also bent down and started to help her. Once they had put everything back in place in the master bedroom, the man stood up and then took the gun out of his front hip pocket. It was Curtis's gun. Clearly, he had found it and stolen it. The man looked at the weapon for a moment as if he was seeing it for the first time. Then he sighed and looked at Mary and said, I guess I won't be needing this anymore. And then he walked over to Curtis's bedside bureau and put the gun back in the top drawer where he had found it. After this, Mary and the stranger left that room and headed for the study next door. Inside, Mary picked up some of the loose papers on the ground, and as she did, she very gently told the man who was standing next to her that she needed to take these papers down to the kitchen. And, you know, maybe it was time for him to be on his way anyhow. The man nodded, and the two headed back downstairs. Once inside the kitchen again, Mary put the papers on the kitchen counter and then turned to face the man who was once again standing awkwardly in the middle of the room. Mary smiled at him and thanked him for helping her clean up the upstairs. And she also told him that he had not done any real damage, so she had no plans to tell anyone or call the police or say anything. She also told him that he was free to take the cash in the dining room on his way out. Then she stepped forward toward the table, and as casually as she could, she picked up the length of metal pipe from the kitchen chair and bent down and placed it under the table out of reach. The man watched her do this. Then, after a pause... He asked if she might be able to give him a ride away from her house. Mary sat down on one of the chairs for a moment, just wishing now that this man would leave. She took a deep breath, and then she looked up at the man, who had now moved to the side door of the kitchen that opened into the side and backyard. Mary looked at him and said, No, I can't give you a ride. Then Mary stood up and walked over to the door with him and pointed through the window on the door to an outside white gate on the edge of their property. And she told him that if he went through that gate and crossed a wooden plank that led over a stream and into the woods, that no one would see him leaving. The man stared at Mary for a few seconds, and then he thanked her for the milk and cookies, and then he looked down kind of sheepishly and said he was sorry that he had hurt her, and then he turned and reached for the doorknob. Mary felt a flood of relief wash over her. She immediately began running over the crazy story she would tell Curtis that night when he came home and they sat together on the couch in the living room talking about their day. Later that same afternoon, Thelma arrived at the schoolyard to pick up Mary's daughters, Janelle and Patty. Scott, happy he had aged out of primary religious education classes, had already started the walk home to his family's farmhouse. There was barely enough room in Thelma's old car for the two girls. They had to squeeze in alongside their little brother Kelly, as well as Thelma's kids who were ages 7, 5, and 3. Janelle was annoyed when Thelma said that she would be back in about an hour or so to pick them up, not their mother. Apparently their mom had called Thelma to arrange a last-second swap because their mom was tied up with something. Janelle didn't care about the last-second swap or getting a ride with Thelma. She just hated how crowded it was in Thelma's old car and didn't want to have to get back in. But Janelle just shrugged and hopped out of the car and began steering the younger children towards the door of the church. 
Sure enough, about an hour later at 5 p.m., Thelma was waiting outside for the kids, and all six of them piled into her tiny car. But instead of Thelma turning south towards their farmhouse, Thelma drove north. When Janelle asked where they were going, Thelma told the kids they were going to her house to meet up with their older brother Scott and Bishop Owen, who was the LDS bishop for their ward. Janelle shrugged again. She had no idea why her brother was at Thelma's, but she didn't care about that. Mostly, she was just feeling irritated as she jostled with her nine-year-old sister Patty for a little more elbow room. As they pulled into the drive leading up to Thelma's small, shabby two-story rental house, Thelma parked next to Bishop Owen's car and then opened the heavy back door of the car to let all the kids out. When they walked through the front door into the small living room, they saw Bishop Owen sitting on the couch holding seven-month-old Russell. In a nearby chair, they saw their brother, Scott, who was watching TV. But he looked like he was staring right through the TV, like he was totally zoned out. Before the children could even say hello, Thelma had shooed Janelle and her sister Patty outside to play with Kelly and Thelma's three children. About an hour and a half later, around 7 p.m., the kids were still outside and it was getting dark and chilly when Patty complained that she needed to use the bathroom. Janelle walked to the back door of the house only to find it locked. Cold, tired, and hungry, Janelle was certain this locked door was the work of her annoying 13-year-old brother, Scott, and she immediately started rattling the doorknob and yelling for him to come and unlock the door and let them in, or she was going to tell their mother. But when she and the other kids heard the bolt pull back, it wasn't Scott standing in front of them, it was Bishop Owen. He stepped aside and all the kids streamed in. Patty headed for the bathroom, while Janelle went straight to the living room to glare at her brother. But when she finally planted herself directly in front of the TV he was watching, she saw right away that something was very, very off about him. Before she could ask him what was wrong, through the window she caught sight of something moving outside. When she turned to look, she saw her father's car pull up next to Thelma's car. And behind her father's car, she saw two police cars, the single dome lights on the roof of each one flashing bright red. Several hours earlier, Mary's son, Scott, left Meridian Junior High School just ahead of his sisters and began the walk home. The walk took about 30 minutes, and at 4 p.m., Scott turned off the main street and started walking down his family's long driveway. As he passed by the detached garage, he noticed his mother's station wagon was gone. Scott thought to himself, if his mom and baby brother were not home, maybe he could just go inside, drop his things off, and then head right back out again and go see his friend, Larry Smith, who lived in the house next door. When Scott walked into his own house through the front door, he reflexively called out for his mother, but there was no answer. However, when he passed through the living room into the dining room, he saw his mother's purse laying on the dining room table with her driver's license and credit cards spilled out next to it. Then he noticed his mother's coat hanging over the end of the baby's crib, and perhaps most surprising, he saw his seven-month-old brother, Russell, in the crib fast asleep. If Russell was here, then his mother surely had to be here too, which was strange since he hadn't seen her car. But regardless, he moved towards the bottom of the stairs and called out again for his mother, but still, there was no answer. The big house was totally quiet. Scott put down his things on the dining room table and headed down the hallway for the kitchen. On the way, he glanced into the powder room, but no one was inside. When he reached the end of the hallway and looked into the kitchen for the first time, he froze. What he saw inside of it was so terrible, he couldn't even begin to process it. There, on the floor, was his mother. Under her head was a red velvet cushion taken from the living room couch. Blood had gushed out of her mouth and formed a huge puddle under her head. There were dark bruises like a collar around her throat. Her blood-soaked, dark red hair looked black. Her eyes were wide open and staring, and her glasses were on the floor next to her. Scott started backing away. He knew without being told that his mother was dead. Then he turned, stumbled, and ran down the hallway, back through the dining room, past his brother, and out the front door. Once outside, he ran along the pathway behind his house to his friend Larry's house. Bursting through their back door, Scott found Larry's mother and frantically explained what he had just seen in the kitchen. As Mrs. Smith picked up the phone to call police, Scott suddenly remembered that he had left his brother, Russell, in the house. Ignoring Mrs. Smith's questions, Scott ran back to his own farmhouse and into the dining room where he saw his brother still laying in his crib fast asleep. 
He carefully lifted Russell out of his little bed and then sat down on the living room couch, holding the baby until police and the local doctor arrived. When police did arrive, they led Scott, who was still holding his brother, back to the Smith's house next door, where Scott called his father at Boeing. After he was off the phone, one of the police officers asked Scott a few more questions about what he had seen. Then the officer drove Scott and Russell over to Thelma's house, where Bishop Owen was waiting for them. When Scott stepped inside of Thelma's house, Bishop Owen took the baby from Scott's arms and began rocking him, and then he settled Scott into a chair and turned on the TV. Scott said nothing. He just sat there staring at the TV with no expression at all on his face. Back at the Campbell's farmhouse, the doctor confirmed that Mary was dead. She had been strangled and hit on the head three times. And when the doctor picked up the pillow that was underneath her head, he noticed a small hole in the pillow with singed edges in the fabric and realized someone had clearly fired a gun into this pillow. And when they examined Mary's head again, they noticed there was a gunshot in her left temple. And so they had placed the pillow over her head, fired that shot into her temple, and then afterwards they had placed the pillow under her head. And that was how she was found. Even before police began collecting evidence, they were totally puzzled by what they saw inside the house. With credit cards left on the dining room table, it did not look like a robbery. And if the attacker was looking for valuables, why did they only pull the clothes out of the drawers in the children's rooms upstairs and not go through the neatly folded items in the closed drawers in the master bedroom where Mary and Curtis slept? And who had been sitting at the kitchen table eating milk and cookies? When Curtis arrived, the police refused to let him into his own house. Dazed and shocked, Curtis just asked, where's my wife's car? And immediately when police saw it was gone from the garage, they sent out a description of the car over the police radio in case the killer had used it to escape. A few minutes later, Curtis was back in his car heading to Thelma's house. Two police cars followed him with their lights flashing red. As Curtis stepped into Thelma's house, his daughter, Janelle, looked from him back at her brother, who she could now tell was crying. Curtis walked to the couch and sat down. He motioned for Janelle and Patty and Kelly to sit down with him. Then he looked at the scared little faces all turned in his direction, and he said, your mother is dead. Someone killed her. Curtis was quickly removed from the list of possible suspects. Dozens of people could confirm that he had been at work that day during the window of time when Mary was killed, sometime between 12.30 p.m. when she arrived home from her church meetings and 2.30 p.m. By 8 p.m. on the night of the murder, police had located the Campbell station wagon in the parking lot of the Group Health Hospital in the town of Renton, three miles away. There were no weapons or blood in the car. All it told police was that the murderer must have gotten a ride to the Campbell's house and then used the station wagon to make their getaway. Once Curtis was allowed back into his house later that night with his children, he went upstairs to check for his gun in his drawer and found it was missing. He told the police about it and they asked him what kind of gun it was and what caliber it was. When he told them, they realized it was the same as the gun that had been used to shoot Mary in the head. Even though there were almost 100 law enforcement personnel working the murder case, by Friday, March 10th, so two days into the investigation, the best lead police had was still just a report from the Campbell's neighbor. The neighbor told police that at about 9.30 a.m. on the day Mary was murdered, she had seen a big man with shaggy hair almost down to his shoulders walking first across the Campbell's front yard and then later that day across their backyard. On that Friday, police got an anonymous tip over the phone that would eventually lead to the break they were looking for. The police were told to check out Art Ferguson, the husband of one of the members of Mary Campbell's church. He matched the description of who the neighbor had seen, and he had recently just gotten a haircut. 21 years old and weighing 220 pounds, Art, along with his 20-year-old wife, Virginia, actually did not have very much information to offer police when they were questioned. While Art did not know the Campbells, his wife Virginia did, and she was totally traumatized by the murder. Between sobs, Virginia kept going over and over what little she knew about Mary's movements the morning of Mary's murder. She'd seen Mary at church, and she'd heard Mary and Thelma making plans for a playdate. She had even visited Thelma after church and seen Mary's son, Kelly, out playing in Thelma's backyard. 
But after Virginia's visit with Thelma, Art and Virginia had not been in Kent. They had spent the afternoon driving 60 miles to eastern Washington to see if Art could find work at two local mills out there. The reason Art had a haircut was because Virginia had insisted that he had to get one. She thought he wasn't getting hired because he looked sloppy. But the next day, Saturday, three days after the murder, police got a call from Art's father. He told them that they better get out to his place. There was something his son needed to tell them. Once police arrived, they found Art sitting at his father's table, head in his hands. He didn't waste any time telling police what had been weighing so heavily on his mind for the last three days. Art told them in a calm voice that he had killed Mary Campbell. Police immediately arrested Art and took him into the police station, and there he spent most of the next day answering questions about his crime. He seemed to have remembered every detail of what happened. The following is based on Art's statement to police. On Wednesday, March 8th, so the day Mary was killed, Art said he walked up the driveway of Mary's farmhouse at about 9.30 a.m. In his pocket was a length of metal pipe. When he reached the house, he let himself in through the kitchen and went upstairs and began ransacking the rooms so that when police investigated the murder he intended to commit, it would look like Mary had been killed by a burglar. When Art found Curtis's gun in the master bedroom, he stuck it into his front pocket along with some ammunition. Then he went back downstairs and hid in the combination powder and bathroom off of the downstairs hallway to wait for Mary to come home from her church meetings. Mary came home and Art attacked her as planned, but right away there was just something about Mary. Her charm totally disarmed him, and instead of killing her, he quickly found himself sitting in the kitchen eating cookies and drinking milk with her. When Art got to the part of the story where Mary had told him how to leave his house without being seen and how she would not call the police, Art paused. He told police at that point he had decided he was not going to kill Mary after all. She was just too nice and had been so kind to him. He told police he remembered turning and grabbing the doorknob and getting ready to walk out that side door. He said he even remembered the sound of Mary's voice behind him as she said goodbye to him. But the next thing Art knew, he had turned around and lunged at Mary, squeezing her neck as tightly as he could. According to his formal police statement, as he choked her, Mary, who was totally surprised, stumbled backward a few steps and both he and Mary slid down the front of the stove to the ground. Art said, quote, She tugged at my shirt front very lightly and once at my hair and tugged very lightly at my sleeve. Art said when his hands got tired and Mary's head fell forward, he released her neck, letting her fall all the way to the ground. Then he turned on his knees and grabbed the metal pipe Mary had shoved under the kitchen table. Art stood up, and with the pipe in his right hand, he swung it down hard at Mary's skull. He hit her three times until blood began to flow out of her mouth. Then he ran upstairs to get Curtis's gun that he had put back earlier when he and Mary were up there. On his way back to the kitchen, he picked up a red velvet pillow from the living room couch. When he knelt down beside Mary, who was now motionless, he put the pillow against her left temple, he pressed Curtis's gun into the pillow, and then fired a single shot. Then he laid Mary down on the floor of her kitchen, resting her head on top of the soft, round, and now blood-soaked pillow. Before leaving the house, Art dumped out the rest of the contents of Mary's purse on the dining room table, pocketing the three dollars and change, and then he took her car keys. Art stepped out of the farmhouse and entered the Campbell's detached garage, he got into Mary's station wagon and then laid the pipe, the gun, the gloves he was wearing, and his jacket on the seat next to him. Then he turned Mary's car on and drove down the driveway out onto the main road. On his way to the hospital parking lot in Renton, where Art would leave the car and drive home in his own vehicle that was parked there, he stopped along an empty stretch of road near the Puget Sound and he threw the gun and pipe out into the woods. Art's story explained every strange circumstance about the crime scene that had left police baffled, from the milk and cookies left on the table, to the ransacked bedrooms, to the baby sleeping unharmed in his little bed. But what it didn't explain was why Art had killed this mother of six, who he didn't even know. Art's bizarre answer to that question would lead the police to another person, the person police would accuse of being the real mastermind behind this murder. On March 8, 1961, the morning of the murder, 
While Mary was busy dropping her kids off at school and then heading for her church meetings, Art was waiting next to his car in the parking lot of the hospital in Renton, about three miles away from Mary's farmhouse. At exactly the agreed-upon time, an older model car pulled up next to him and idled for a minute as Art opened the passenger door and climbed inside. The driver of the car asked Art if he was ready to go and whether he needed to take one more look at the map. Days earlier, the driver had made a hand-drawn map showing a detailed layout of the Campbell's farmhouse. Art had been told to memorize it, along with the usual route that Mary Campbell took through her house when she came home with her baby. Art was feeling nervous and thought looking at the map again might calm him down. The driver handed him the piece of folded paper. As Art sat there studying it, he tried to use the memorization technique the driver had taught him that would apparently sear the image into his mind. Meanwhile, the driver put the car in gear and pressed the gas pedal. On the way to the Campbell's farmhouse, the driver stopped and bought two gallons of gas at a gas station and paid by check. When they arrived near the entrance to the Campbell's long gravel driveway, the driver took back the hand-drawn map, they made sure Art had his piece of metal pipe inside of his jacket pocket, and that Art knew exactly where to find Curtis Campbell's loaded pistol. The driver also told Art to be sure he used a pillow from the couch to silence the sound of the shot that Art would eventually fire directly into Mary's temple. Art nodded. Just before he climbed out of the car, a pink and black truck passed by them on the main road. Art's driver only watched Art for a few seconds as he walked up the driveway toward the farmhouse. Then the driver checked their watch and turned the car around and pulled back onto the road and started heading for their next stop. About three hours later, at 12.30 p.m., when Art ambushed Mary inside of her house, Art's driver was standing in a different house in front of a kitchen clock, watching the minute hand with intense concentration. The person standing next to the driver would later tell police she could make out the words the driver was speaking as they stared at the clock. Do it. Do it. Do it, they said. An hour later, the driver again looked at the clock. This time, the driver, aka the real mastermind behind the murder of Mary Campbell, smiled and then ran her fingers through her short, dark curls and looked out the window at Mary's son, Kelly, playing in her yard. Then, Thelma Swenson, the hard luck case that Mary and Curtis had tried so hard to help, the babysitter who had once lived with them and who knew exactly where Curtis's loaded gun was and what Mary's everyday routines were when she got home from church or from running errands, turned to her good friend, Art's young wife, Virginia, and hugged her. And then, according to Virginia, Thelma swayed slowly side to side while holding on to Virginia and said, I know where Art is. He's up there right now butchering Mary Campbell. When Art confessed to the murder of Mary Campbell, he told police that he was only acting on the orders of Thelma Swenson. He said she planned every detail of the attack. Art, who was mentally challenged and highly suggestible, claimed that he had been manipulated by Thelma into believing Mary Campbell was an evil person. In terms of getting him to commit the actual crime, Art said Thelma had used hypnosis. And when police checked local town library records, they would see that Thelma had checked out several books on mesmerism. Art accused Thelma of basically putting him into a trance and then literally walking him through every step he followed once he was inside of Mary's house. Police would later find a copy of that hand-drawn map of the Campbell's farmhouse in Thelma's house. The gas station attendant who took Thelma's $2 check on the morning of the murder and later the driver of that pink and black truck that had passed by would both confirm that they saw Art in Thelma's car the morning of the murder. According to Art's wife, Virginia, Thelma had drawn her into the plot as well. Virginia told police that Thelma had met with both her and Art and asked them how they would go about killing someone and not getting caught. It was through these conversations she was having with Art and with Virginia that Thelma began to put together a plan to murder Mary Campbell. Virginia claimed that Thelma had even made her and Art rehearse how Art might strangle Mary using a length of electrical cord with Virginia playing the part of the victim. But after Art had actually attacked Mary in her home, he told police that he genuinely had decided he was not going to kill Mary after all. It was like he had come out of his trance and he saw her for the person she really was, this really wonderful person. 
But, he said, after he turned to actually leave the house, he fell back under Thelma's control again. And then the next thing he knew, he was standing there in the kitchen with his hands around Mary's neck. It would turn out Thelma had a history of psychiatric problems and had been hospitalized twice. Once following a diagnosis of schizophrenia, a mental illness that can cause episodes of psychosis, delusions, and paranoia. Her estranged husband, who had never physically abused Thelma, would also testify that she was a pathological liar. According to Art and Virginia, far from being grateful to Mary for her help and support, Thelma had developed a deep hatred of Mary. She blamed Mary for the breakup of Thelma's own marriage, which didn't really make any sense, but she did, and even claimed that her estranged husband was the father of Mary's seven-month-old baby, even though the baby had been born in New Jersey before the Campbells had even met Thelma. Police also investigated the possibility that Thelma was becoming obsessed with Curtis and saw Mary as an obstacle to Thelma pursuing that relationship. For his part, Curtis had already begun to suspect that Thelma was mentally unstable and that she was using makeup to fake the bruises that she claimed were the result of her estranged husband's physical abuse. For these reasons, in the weeks leading up to Mary's murder, Curtis had told Mary that they really should break off their friendship and involvement with Thelma. However, Mary wouldn't hear of it. She believed Thelma needed them and Mary did not want to abandon her. On September 23, 1961, just six months after Mary's murder, both Art Ferguson and Thelma Swenson were found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. But that was not the end of this murder case. Two years later, on June 6, 1963, the Washington Supreme Court overturned the conviction against Thelma and ordered a new trial for her. Five months later, a new jury would acquit Thelma of all charges. While the court denied Thelma's request for custody of her three children, Thelma would go on to marry again and have a second set of three children before divorcing her second husband and taking those three children with her. In her memoir about her mother's death titled The Multiple Murders of Mary Kelly Campbell, Janelle Campbell writes that as of 2021, Thelma Swenson was still alive. Out of deference to Thelma's family, the author does not include any details about Thelma Swenson's current life or location. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone-chilling content be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today but in video format on our YouTube channel which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time see you.